Hi, and welcome to the Margie and Lisa show. I'm Margie Wiggin. I'm Lisa Jackson. And we're glad you could join us this evening. We have three segments. The first one is about curling, the sport of curling. <laughs> Not just for your hair, it's actually a sport. And uh, then we're gonna have Frank Durso coming in as our guest to talk about the planning board. And finally, we're gonna talk about spring planting, what you can do now to ensure that you have beautiful plants when it finally gets to be spring. So, so curling. Yeah. <laughs> so curling, I thought this was a great subject Margie brought up and I, I always kind of wondered what the hubbub was and I didn't watch it on the Olympics, but mm -hmm. I saw the news reels of it. And I, I looked up the history and it was interesting. It was one of the first team sports ever played. It's four players on a rectangular sheet of ice and its nickname is the Roaring Game. Huh, and why do they call it the roaring? So that originates from the rumbling, rumbling sound of the 44-pound ah. granite stones oh, I've heard that. That, cra that travel across okay. the ice. So okay. I thought that was kind of interesting. And it has Scottish origins. Yes. And again, like I said, it was the oldest team sports. It originated in the 16th century. Cool. Where the games were played during winter on frozen ponds and locks. Um, the early known curling stones came from Scottish regions of Stirling and Perth. And the date from 1511. Wow. That's when they can record it back 1511. to. Yeah. And, and then, so it was very. And then in the 1600s, so it was just stones till 1511. And then in the 1600s, they introduced the handle oh. on the stone. So they would just push it before. Yeah, that. before they just kind of push it. And so I thought, it, you know, I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't realize it was so old. And then I'll go over the key developments. The first clubs appeared in Scotland. Um, it was a Grand Candelian Curling Club formed in 1838, so that was the first club. And they were responsible for forming the official rules, which I know you're going to mm -hmm. talk about. And the club was renamed um, the Royal Candelonian Curling Club. <laughs> so I don't know why they changed it. They from grand to royal, so maybe. So it, so just one, if I can yeah. interject, if there's anybody watching who is a curler right or who has done curling i know in high school i had some friends who actually had were at a curling club in wayland yeah that's and what at, i found and they um they loved it and they competed and i went right. to watch them so i've known about that for a long time yeah. so if there's anybody watching you call us yeah tell us what you know about it why do you love it why you it's like so it so interesting right um that we just figured we we would learn more about it ourselves right. but if you already know we'd love to hear from you and um uh, 508-435-7880. Yep. And I found three three curling clubs within probably 15, 20 minutes of us. So there's one in Wayland, as you mentioned, it's called Broomstones Curling That's Club. That's it, Broomstones. I and think. then Marlboro Curling Club is at New England oh. Sports Center. And there's ba Blackstone Valley Curling Club in Hopedale. So I was very surprised to find that. So that's what's the, what's the one in um, Hopedale? Uh, yeah. Uh, Blackstone Valley Curling Club. Okay. And then the New England Sports Center, which is huge in Marlboro, that's a huge oh, right. complex. I know. Yeah. yeah, they have a curling club there as well. So cool. apparently it's quite popular. Yep. So. So I looked. So yeah. What I did rules. was I <laughs> went to just find, um, I found something called the Beginner's Guide to the Rules yeah. of Curling because it's so weird. You it know, and, and actually looking at the, looking at the, the, what do they call it? Not the field, but um, looking at the, the place that they have it, right. it looks like it's called a curling ice sheet. Yes. It looks like the target symbol. Yeah. It's a, it's a red right. outer and that's ring how with they a red get a dot in the middle. So I'm wondering if the people who started target are curlers. Right. I don't think so, but it was funny. And um, so the, the uh, technicality here is that it's about 146 feet long by 15 feet, seven inches wide, which they're saying is about the length of a hockey rink. So it's about so that So you same. have to drop that 44 pound stone, slide it, and then you have to sweep. Well, what they're doing yeah, is- Yeah, tell me about so, the sweeping, because so I they give it. Well, what they're doing is the sweeping reduces the friction, because okay. when they push that, you saw like John Schuster, the star of the day, he's from uh, Minnesota, yep. the, the, our leader there. He's actually um, got a birthday, the same as uh, my ex-husband. So November 3rd, 1982, John Schuster got a gold um, from Chisholm, Minnesota, first gold ever for the Americans. But anyway, so nice when he, what he does is he's what's called the skip. 
Right, I saw so that. So he's yeah. the leader. And there's four but members, there's some. Yeah. There are four players: the yeah. lead, the second, the third, and the skip. So the skip goes last. Yes. Because the other players are the ones that are reducing the friction. Yeah. The reason it's called curling is because there are little pebbles of ice. What they do is they spray the surface of ice, which yeah. leaves little pebbles. And so the peb, little pebbling, is what makes the curl. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I didn't know why it was called curling. It was the, so technical. The <laughs> idea, so there are two houses, they call them. Yeah. And um, there was a very funny comment from Samantha in the, in the corner office here who said, it's the only sport where you're supposed to throw stones. Because <laughs> right. that's what they, I love that. That's what they that's call it. Cute. It's called throwing the right. rock. Throwing at rocks. the house, yeah. that's what it's called. Right, right. So there are twelve foot bullseyes with the center, and the center is called the button. Why is it called the button? I don't know. <laughs> but it's called the button. So the rocks are are. Um, so what they do is they kind of hold that handle and they very carefully slide sort of slide it. it and then they let it go. And all the sweeping is to re get the friction and the little pebbling out of the way so the rock will go straight. Just and you could, I heard John Schuster at the Olympics saying, little to the left, little to the left. So there's a very, there's a very fine-tuned finesse right. in the sweeping, which <laughs> looks like sweeping. It seems so but silly, yeah, but yeah. You sweep it more on the, this side, right. I, I could see you how could it, guide would, it. it would curl right. the stone. <gasps> oh. So that's what it is. Oh. So they're making, they're, they're moving the little ice pebbling on top of the, to make the, to make the track. stone go to the button. <laughs> So in the house that you're I throwing the rock at. I apologize for laughing. No, it's the, just, if it's, it's a serious sport, but it's it you is. know. Well, Margie, can you see your technique again? Like, yeah. Which one? Sh yeah. <laughs> the sweeping. She had a lot of good technique going there. I I have never played this. I'm gonna have to play it now. Now I know. It just Me looks too. so fun. Well, it looks and fun. And actually, they have to the position they hold. Right. They have to do a lot of squats and they have to do a lot of Great. exercise right. to hold their bodies. So, and they have to be quite fit. They do. It's a good thing. So there are a couple of other interesting things, and and I'm I mean I'm kind of making fun of it because it I, I don't, don't understand know anything it. About, I don't right. understand it. But um, so the, they're supposed to wear something that looks like tennis shoes. So they're you know it looks like tennis shoes. Um, they're they're yelling. Yeah. What they're yelling is hurry hard. Oh. Hurry hard, which I think this would seem to me right, sweep harder. Yeah, yeah. Right, so hard, hard line, or go means sweep harder to maintain the current path. Clean means sweep lightly. Whoa, never, or off. Guess what that means? What? Whoa. Super never. Whoa. means yeah. stop. Yeah. <laughs> stop sweeping. Um, because great. the rock went the wrong way. It looks heavy means it was thrown too hard. Uh, and it might go past the target. Uh, it's very complicated. Looks light. I mean, it wasn't pushed hard enough, right? It's so cool. You think it'd be so hard to get at that distance? Not with the sweeping. Not with the sweeping. <laughs> so know. then, so there. It says, are they just wearing running, sho running shoes? This says yes and no. While it may appear they're wearing normal pairs of kicks, they also wear different soles. One for their sliding foot and one for the right. gripping foot. Right. So if they're both slippery, that's not gonna work, but right. they have to slide with the stone until right. they release. And then this says, what's with the funny pants? Um, oh, I so forgot. <laughs> there was Norway had a team, Thomas Ulsrud, and they named the team after the skip. So we had Team Schuster, I guess. But they started wearing them in the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver to stand out from the crowd, and it seems to have been working. Stuck. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, you look at golfers, they were, you know, they were interesting. You know, it's interesting, too. So mm -hmm. I, I found great reasons to try the sport of curling. Because I was curious, like, yeah. what, how do people actually get into this? It seemed to me like it'd be like a long family tradition. We don't do it in schools. Like, how do you actually decide that you want to be a curler? Curling? So, you know, one of the things they came up, you can play at any age. Both sexes can play. On the same team, so it's but not... But what makes you interested, though? Right. What? Rules are easy to learn. Yeah. So... I think um, it just looks like fun. You don't have to pay a lot to play. Mm -hmm. Apparently, it's inexpensive. Mm -hmm. Curling is good for your health, and curling is wheelchair accessible. 
Oh, which I didn't oh. think about. So yeah. in that, well, yeah, because if you think about it, you could I can see curling in a wheelchair. Right. That's cool. Right. So you know, do we have a call or is that? Oh, no. that's Frank. <laughs> yeah. So so why should people take up curling? And I thought this is a great description. People who curl seem to share a certain fun-loving attitude towards this pastime. And you see Margie and I, we're enjoying just talking about yeah. it. We haven't even curled. Yes, and I actually enjoyed watching when my friends played. Oh, you watched, you went oh, to- Oh yeah, my friends you were went in- You went to Wayland to my watch friends were Cause in, you were, grew up, well, Newton. Newton. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanna, um, the, oh, oh, yeah. the, the captain is the skip who calls the shots. He throws the seventh and eighth stones. Okay. So that those are the last. Um, the third is sort of the vice captain or vice skip. He sweeps, sweeps the first four, throws the fifth and sixth stones, and then um, he's in the house during the, when the skip, when the last stones are thrown. So, so everybody gets to throw a stone? Is that how? Yeah, they all take different turns. Ah. Then the second sweeps the first two, throws the third and fourth, sweeps the final four, <laughs> and the lead throws the first and second, sweeps the following six. So they take turns sweeping and they take turns throwing, which makes sense. Yep. And then um, they play to 10 ends, which is the same as an inning or a period. So there are 10 times that they get to throw the stone, mm -hmm. which I don't know why they just call it slide the stone, but it's throwing. Yep. And then um, sometimes they'll concede if the other team knows they can't catch up, right. which just makes sense to me. Right. Um, and then having the hammer means you get to throw last at the end. So, so I would think advantage. that's an, exactly. It's an advantage, yeah, like baseball when you, yep. Right, and then at the end, the team that's the closer to the button or the pin yep. begins the game with the hammer when there's the next one. Um, team, blah, blah, team without the hammer has the closest rock. Mm -hmm. This is called a steal. There's a steal in curling. Really? What happens if there are no rocks in the house when the end is complete? That's called a blank, which makes sense. There's right. no score. Nobody got it. <laughs> That makes sense. That's, um, what, that's how we start when we start playing <laughs> right. curling. And then what they did say about the rules was they used to have different rules in the 1980s, um, and the team with the hammer was going to just knock out all the other stones and then score one in the and the tenth. Yeah. But now they changed the rules, so there's a free guard zone and a four rock rule, which I guess just makes it more interesting because right. you just wait till your tenth round and knock everyone out, or you know, right. that's no fun. Um, so the guard is the stone that's in, in a resting position in the center. So the stones sitting in the inside of the ring yep. are called guards and cannot be removed until four stones have been thrown. That seems like such a random rule, but you know, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> they've been doing this they, for a long they time. Wanted, but they knew yeah. what they were doing. <laughs> and then it says, and then when the guard um, gets bumped out, they can put it back at its original resting position because there's a little dent in the ice where it was. Oh. So they know where it goes. That's kind of funny. And then what are hog lines? Yeah, what is that? So we have we have throwing stones at houses, right. rocks at houses. We have hog lines. <laughs> um, this is the hog lines determine if the rock is in play. While sliding, the shooter has to release the rock before it crosses the first hog line. So I did see that. So if they're sliding up to the line, yeah. they have to let go of it before they get to that first line, and then the sweepers. And the rock has to cross the second hog line to remain in play. Interesting. So it makes sense. What happens if the thrower releases too late or doesn't cross? Then, you know, it's called burned, and they, that rock is burned, and they take it out of play. Hmm. Um, yeah. So I the, the stone a itself. the strategy, the, oh, the there temperature is. of the stone. Mm -hmm compared to the ice. I wonder if they're, that makes a difference. I don't think they heat them. No, I know, but I was wondering what, I mean, do you want room temperature? Do you want the same temperature I think the they ice? have to be consistent about that. Yeah. Like with inflated, yeah, that, I just inflated thought of footballs. It. Right. Um, and so the curling stone weighs about 42 mm -hmm. pounds. Different kinds of shot. There's a draw, which means it's thrown um, with an intention of finishing at a specific spot. There's a hit thrown with the intention of making contact. Um, and there are just all these others. There's something called a tick shot. Hmm. When there's a four rock rule in play to nudge a guard out of the way. Peel is hitting a stone to remove it and the shooter. Nose is hitting another stone right on the top so the shooter doesn't roll out. So there's just all this interesting terminology. Yeah. Um, and there's more than that, but you know, here's one. There's a wreck 
when a stone <laughs> accidentally makes contact with another stationary stone that the thrower was trying to avoid. So they have all this in a flash, a rock that's thrown through the house. Yeah. It doesn't stay it in the house. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I found interesting, apparently even on the world stage in this sport, there's a lot of great sportsmanship. Yeah. Which I thought was interesting because even nice. at the Olympic level, because you know how sports, they're very competitive. But one thing about curling, I guess, is curling teams are known for their sportsmanship and enjoying cool. to get to know their other t the people they're playing, the other teams that they're playing. So I thought that was kind of interesting, know too. Nice. So I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. So, you know. That's really good. And imagine being at a hockey game or a football oh. game and everybody palling around and being friends That's true, and laughing. And I, I didn't notice any of the curlers punching or pushing or <laughs> right. jumping on each other. <laughs> right, when right. It, when, so it, at school, at, at Elmwood School, the kids play Newcomb. And What's they try that? to jump. It's like volleyball, and they catch and throw. But yeah. they tend to, ta you know, yeah. tackle. I said, "This is not tackle. There's no tackle in right. no Same thing. No, sport. no yeah. contact in curling. So, can they take as long as they want to throw a rock? No. Oh, so they have a time in limit. Olympic curling. Each team has 38 minutes of thinking time. 38 minutes per so game. I mean, means the total, which <laughs> is indicated on a timer at the end of the sheet. The clock ticks down while they're deciding which shot to make. Yeah. But they can take thinking time like chess. You know, just and to strategize. Say, how am I, exactly. How am I gonna? How am I gonna sweep the eyes? How am I gonna sweep? How am I gonna sweep? And yeah. I think it's interesting. The last, well, the last player, the skip makes sense, but I think yeah. it's interesting. Like skip seems like it would be lower man on the totem pole, but really he's the leader of the team, or he kind of strategizes, or is the captain. Exactly. So I thought so that was kind of interesting. So there's too. a. You guys already saw the Olympics. So here's a little picture. You probably can't see it, but this is Team John Schuster. It's named after him. <laughs> the guy from Minnesota. Yep. Um, out of Duluth, represented for the fourth time at the Winter Olympics. He he got a uh, bronze uh, a couple years ago, but he, they call it the Miracle on Ice. <laughs> I love it. You know, they have a good sense of humor. So they, so they beat. He beat Canada and Sweden, who were, you know, yeah, they're the top favorites. There, yeah, um, five-time U.S. champion and had had bronze at uh, another um, another Olympics recently. So that's it's, so cool. It's a really cool thing, and I know, you know, my friends, my friends in high school loved it. Really, way back then. So how did your friends get involved in it? I'm curious. I, there's not like a team. I or, don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I think possibly, you know, because um, my friends, they, these were friends that went to Rivers Country Day, so that's in Weston. Okay. So these were from Weston Wayland, Wayland. guys. And they and the may have had there. parents right. who belonged. And then the parents brought the kids, and then the kids got interested, and the kids okay. competed is the only thing I could think of. You know, so... Uh, I don't know, but now it's in the now Olympics. Now we gotta try it. We gotta it's in the check Olympics. it out. And, uh, and, and you didn't realize how close it was. We have three places that are. I didn't know there was more than broomstones. And yeah, I so, but that you know, I, I, we recommend you try crowing because it sounds <laughs> like it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and you probably could go watch right. even if you didn't play or right. I don't really know, uh, but it is. I, I found it fascinating. Yeah. Because I could see, right. I could see the focus. I could see the concentration. Right. And I the could camaraderie. See John Schuster, you know, no, don't do that. Go over the. <laughs> so well, serious. How does he even know which way the thing is going to slide? Instinct. And the and the sweeping so hard, you know, and focus on. It seems a little silly because we you think need of those sweeping 37 minutes as to... a household chore. <laughs> right. You know, but it's a very technical part of this very incredibly interesting sport. It's great. So. But anyway, that's the end of that segment. I hope you enjoyed it, Margie. We did. Yeah, we did. We thought it was, that was actually a lot of fun. Um, we're going to take a little break, and we'll be back with the planning board. Yep, Frank Durso is going to join us to talk about the planning board. What is it, what does it do, and why is it important? See you soon. This week on HCAM, the Center School Reuse Advisory Team held their first public forum at the Senior Center. Community Center. A community center. This would involve not only the young people, but the older people, the middle people, and that would involve and be a lot of pride in the community. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, B. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have you ever considered texting and driving? If so, you should know the consequences. If caught texting and driving for the first time, you could get in a $100 fine plus your license taken away for 60 days. The consequences only get worse the more you get caught. 
Even if you don't get caught, there could be serious effects. You could get into a car accident and hurt yourself or someone else. Texting and driving is a very dangerous combination, so stop before this happens to you. This week on Hopkin and Coffee Break, Patricia, Connie, and Dolly sit down with author Meredith O'Brien. Uh, well, uh, Nancy Cleary, who is the publisher, she did a, uh, a feature story with one of the publications I wrote for, and I happened to see her profiled, and, and I called her, and I said, well, you were just profiled in the same same uh, publication where I run my columns. You want to be interested in a, in a book of columns, and that's how it just started. <laughs> Welcome back. So now we are in our second segment of the Margie and Lisa show, and we are very fortunate to have with us Frank Durso of the Planning Board. Um, I noticed that there were several vacancies on the Planning Board coming up, and so we thought we'd like to hear what's it all about. Tell us what, it's, what it does and why would people want to do this, and why is it important for the town? Well, the Planning Board is not as fun as curling. <laughs> <laughs> really? But we are a good team, yeah. and uh, there's nine members on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all elected. Um, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes someone might not be able to continue, so we'll have an appointed member now and then. But um, our main goal is to do planning. So yep. we put together the master plan for the town every five to ten years or so. Uh, we just completed one last year. Uh, Friend Young and I concentrated on the economic development portion of it. We're trying to get more restaurants and businesses downtown, mm -hmm. and um, hopefully. Uh, we can do that with our downtown revitalization going on. It'll oh, good. Find a way to maybe to increase mm -hmm. parking lots. Oh, good. Um, Steven likes our video, by the way. Thanks, Steven. <laughs> and um, we hear uh, plans for construction and changes in construction of projects. And we administer the scenic road bylaw, uh, mm -hmm. make sure that yeah, it's being followed. Right. And, uh, which protects the trees and, and uh, stone walls uh, and the scenic look of the town uh, for the streets that have that bylaw associated with it. We uh, appoint members to design review, and design review is a subcommittee. It's oh, a good okay. way to start and get familiar with I the planning board. That. So, design uh, review board is a subcommittee of planning. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, they review uh, what a building looks like, how it how it fits into the town, and if, if it's uh, if it fits mm. the look of the town. Uh, so then, have, can I ask a quick question about that? Mm -hmm. So the, the brick, um, what I call the brick box, which is the vacant space that um, Next Greg to Mazur, Beach. yeah, has had. D does that fit with the other buildings in the town there? Well, I think that he's done a great job of making it <clears throat> fit in a way that the, the patio is beautiful. Yeah, properties behind it mm -hmm. uh, that he also owns all mm -hmm. fits nicely together but there really needs to be more around it in regards to parking right he um, I, that's what i heard just prospective uh, tenants were looking at so what park. about that lot next to it that hopkinton drug lot yeah right well that's privately owned and that's for for that business to right. to also survive um in some in some levels it's up to the businesses to work together to yes because right. that's a large lot and i never see it all the way full because when brigham we'll was actually there have, they have, have two lots right they have the one off 85 and then the one off mm -hmm. main street so it's it could it could work as a parking area is no, there no. A, oh sorry go ahead you were going to say oh. the same thing oh are there any businesses that you know of they're planning on potentially using that space the space the where? brick building Oh, not as yet. Yes. <laughs> I, I, originally, it was going to be three stories, <laughs> oh. and oh. I, I was like, "Well, that's kind of kind of yeah. big." And then, our bylaws don't allow that, right? In the downtown uh, area, up to three. Oh, oh they, they do. The oh, in my humble opinion, to have a three-story three brick building there would look like center school. It would look I like guess one of the well, schools. They reconsidered. I mean, town hall is three stories, so I guess. Yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah. but then it's yeah. that, and then the lower yeah. wooden ones, and then. Um, well, they, right. they reconsidered and said, well, you know, two stories might fit better. And then mm -hmm. they realized that, well, you know, we'll, we'll probably just do one because that I would actually be the like, best. I like it the way it is. I, I could know. see, um, I've heard that some restaurants were interested in it. Good. But but when they looked at it, they didn't have the parking, so they backed out. Or they. Right. That's, that's what I and heard that someone else said. Yeah. But who knows? Who knows? Right. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I would love to see an Indian restaurant coming mm. in. I know we talked about it. Um, because there is a population 
as well as the fact that it's delicious food, you yeah. know, that would add to pan thai, Chinese, mm -hmm. right. pizza, 110. Well, an excellent idea that Fran de Young had uh, mm -hmm. when we were discussing the economic development plan or the master plan was uh, he'd like to have something called Restaurant Row. And when there was the three businesses where Hop News had been and um, right. country, the country store, and uh, now there are businesses in there and a, a restaurant type of idea, I, I think. Well, it's um, a, um, the table. The, the, they provide the table. The they provide um, furniture for uh, like weddings and so there's no food in there. Okay, oh, uh, I haven't been in yeah. there. Yeah, and it's beautiful oh. furniture. I, mean, I think they they provided the um, the furnishings for the HCA um, Starry Night Gala. Nice, nice. So they're, they're you know, but the, there's no food there. It's just mm. producing ambiance. I haven't ambience. been by much since Town Hall's been closed down for repair. Uh, and uh, I've been to the library just two or three times since this has been redone. Yeah. Um, but we really do need more of an anchor thing. Right. right. I agree. I think Restaurant Row is a wonderful idea mm -hmm. um, just to have. I know um, my daughter is in Athens, Georgia at the University of GA. And, and that the downtown is, yeah. you know, similar to Wellesley. <laughs> not that we want to look. I, I mean, the look of Wellesley is a little too... Uh, for me, it's not as too urban, yeah. right? It's not as um, well, it's warm. It's longer streets. It's and a different thing, and that, and it's just a, more of a city, yeah, it's right. looking. But we we like our warm, you right. know, Hopkinton feel. Um, but having said that, it, it is you know nice to have more than one choice, mm -hmm. right? Or or four. There are four choices: so two pizzas, a pan thai, and. And I think people are eating out more in general. So I think there, you know, there might be a market for it. One thing I'm curious about with what was the master plan? So I, I participated in it when on the land use study committee, we provided input to the master plan quite a few years ago. But with as a planning board, what were the highlights of the master plan that you guys came up with? And how many years out? Do you, is it every five years you do it? The master plan or? Yeah, we, we usually start, for, we probably start the next one about three years. Okay. So. Um, it might be every 10 years. Okay. I'm not sure. I've only been on the board four years. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what were the highlights? Highlights for me, <laughs> I, well, the part that I, you know, me and Fran worked on economic development, I think is really key to the future of sure. the town. Um, we covered a lot of different areas of, of town where we think there could be development for mm -hmm. commercial uses, and um, that feeds that kind of study and report feeds the efforts of the, the Zoning Advisory Committee, which is another committee that we appoint right. members to. Yeah. And um, Oh, is that right? Yep. So you send you send members yeah. to Zach, mm -hmm. but it's not a subcommittee, it's just a separate. It's a subcommittee. It is, yeah. so you have mm -hmm. you have um, a couple subcommittees then. Two, Two. right. Okay. And then we have internal working committees that we have. Yeah. Um, uh, Cliff Kisner and I are both on the Economic Outreach Committee for the board now. And, uh, so what zones lo looked like it, when you guys did the master plan looked like a good space for more businesses to come in? What areas were you guys Well, there's the work about? that Paul Mastriani is doing near Lumber Street and the, okay. of the gateway to the town. Yeah. Um, I know the um, Chamber of Commerce is behind that project. Um, the green, the greenery along that way. They, they that all is, I think that's so that beautiful. It is. And I love nice. the development of that Lumber Street complex it really is with mm -hmm. 110 and um, there's a lot of usable cycle city and the spoon and, yeah. and um well Spoonery. milford yeah milford hospital has their yes, lab there yes so they have a walk-in mm -hmm. clinic and i mean there's a lot of great it's a nice and and there's tons of parking mm -hmm. yeah so that works and you plan it right yeah, yeah. exactly yes, and then what other what other areas did you look at you looked at the lumber street and where's the green the Greenway, or what? Well, the, along, the, along. It's the median uh, east, between West Main the, Street. Yeah, oh. right by 495, just past Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, they that. They planted trees there, so beautiful. Oh, now gotcha. that the winter's ending, the green will yeah. revive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, I, I just didn't, I didn't. Yeah, that's great. Every 10 or 20 feet, there's another corporation or family that yeah. sponsors it. I saw it. that. Yeah. yeah, I just didn't know where it was, so I was asking. <laughs> so, any other areas in Hopkinton that look like per? possible uh, well there's places. a lot of discussion about the <clears throat> hotel Street. overlay district and possible changes to that which would currently includes lumber street uh parts of south street and um parkwood avenue the mm -hmm. other side of um the north side of lumber street and um that's encouraging we've we've heard that you know possibly that's a solution for the 
gas companies, sure. transfer station, which they would still like to do. Um, it's further away from people's homes, uh, far away from the school, which is uh, good. And, yeah, it, recently, they, two days ago, they, they sent a letter saying that they're not going to put it next to the uh, Elmwood School. Yay! So it's a really that's good, good victory for the citizens. Because that's what I ever, that, yeah. thank yeah. goodness. Oh, my goodness. Because that's all I could think was. Right. And, and sadly, in view of recent <clears throat> school shootings, you know, it's really sad that we even have to think about a stranger doing something that it's might sabotage. be harmful mm -hmm. right. to to children. And, uh, you know, that's just on my mind constantly because yeah. I'm a, a very protective person and I feel like I'm always, you know, my well, radar is on. I was on. really proud of the way that the Board of Selectmen came together with yeah. the planning board. I'm so happy. Um, all people of all sides came together and supported yeah. each other. And, um, and we made our speeches and we made our declarations and, um, and, and, and it, the energy companies saw that you know, there is resolve in our, in yes, our town yes. uh, against it and Good. Uh, for safety reasons and so on. And the Board of Selectmen owns a safety feature of the town. Mm -hmm. The planning board plans for the safety. Yes, of, of course. Town, so of course. Well, you augment with their So are you here. saying that the gas gate is not going to be going there? Right. Oh, That's perfect. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. And that was largely due to the, the efforts of the neighbors that banded yes. together. Oh, yes. And, um, we had Summer Dennis in here. Excellent. One of our first episodes um, mm -hmm. to talk about, mm -hmm. oh, that was before you, yeah, before um, to talk about No Gas Gate. Because mm -hmm. she lives right, you know, right near Elmwood. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just this, the frightening thought of something happening. And when you talk about people that might be running for planning board, there's a suggestion right there, Summer. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she'd, be, she'd be good. Um, so also with this planning and, and increasing economic development, um, what are the talks about traffic and and roads and things like that? So bike that's lanes. A, yeah, bike lanes and How many where in your master plan. Lanes. I know that's part of it. So I think I think in the master plan, I, don't quote me, but I think there yeah. is this aspect that we we do need to follow state law and have bike lanes marked and yeah. have signage, proper signage. Um, the downtown revitalization. I know that's an older term, but uh, that plan mm. is going to have bike lanes. And it's going to follow state law, and um, I'm a proponent of just have the painted bike lanes yeah. as they have mostly in Cambridge and Boston. Yes, I agree a with that. As higher well. concentration of cars instead of the the curb and the thing. And mm. I, I I couldn't figure out how is that going to work. How do you plow if there's it? a how curb? You, yeah, you know, and then a curb and then another curb. All I could imagine was. Someone looks to the you know to the left for a second, and then they're over the curve, and they're off the bike, and then they're squashed like a bug. It's not a good thing. <laughs> no, and so, then I was I was riding I think through Wellesley again. Mm -hmm. um, they have the painted lanes, and they have a painted lane. But it was interesting because they had a section where the lane ran out, but they the and train it track. said mm -hmm. the bikes are going to now be on the car lane. Right. Mm -hmm. he's like, so you're supposed to just watch out, width. watch yeah. out for the for the bike. The sign says share the road. Into yeah. the share the road. Of, so yeah. that is what I imagine happening mm -hmm. here because our road just doesn't look well, wide enough to. Well, me. even with the curbs, I mean, how does DPW maintain it? How do they mm -hmm. plow it? How do they? I mean, that just creates an incredible yeah. workload to just yeah. even try to manage that. Well, I've, I've looked into this pretty mm -hmm. extensively in different towns and in, in cities in Cambridge has tried it four or five different ways. Mm. And it's, I think what works best is this, the, the painted line for the lane with the mm -hmm. bike symbols. Yep. Cars do not go into those lanes. Right, mm -hmm. and um, they can be fined if they go in, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. yep. But right. also if they need to turn, then the bikes need to yield for the car's turn. Of course, turn. Yep. And, there's, and there's signs saying that along the way. Yeah, I think the car should yield for the bike and the bike should yield for the car. Right. There seems to be a sometimes pattern. a little yeah. conflict, you know, of someone being annoyed. But if everyone would just, well, it's get a along, yeah. right? It's um, a traffic pattern, so you follow absolutely. the rules of what in the well, state law are. is that bikes yeah. do share the road with the cars, and yeah. cars need to be aware of that. And right. it's a public awareness situation more than anything. And helping that would be the, defining the bike lanes. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll talk about the paint. That. Uh, we'll talk about bike yeah. lanes, but not painted <laughs> surfaces because that makes it mm -hmm. slick. Uh, some of right. the Hopkinson pointed that out. Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's it, a bad it does. Idea. Yeah, especially if you have a street bike. Right, and I also thought that w when they talked about the Main Street Corridor and the bike lanes, having three different types of bike lanes seemed very confusing to Which me. Which is how they have in Cambridge. just have one kind. It's because I think they were experimenting, and Cambridge uh, has the kind of type of bike lane where you 
have one lane on Mass Ave, one yeah, lane in, that, one lane out. Mm, parking mm, and then mm, the bike lane. On, mm, so if you open mm, your right hand door, you don't expect a, a bike. Kaboom. Yeah. yeah. I just think it's crazy. And, and I think also for consistency, every person coming through our town would know this is the kind of bike lane. This is the rule we follow. Yep. And then there's Keep no confusion. Yeah. Um, John has a question <clears throat> on email. Thanks, John. That says, what role does open space play in mm. planning? Well, currently, uh, if, if that's John, our chairman of the planning board and chairman of the open space. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, open space is, is very vital to keeping the nature of our town rural uh, mm -hmm. as much as possible. Um, identifying parcels of, of property that come up for sale, could come up for sale, that could be used for construction, that maybe isn't in the right location for construction. Mm -hmm. uh, and then mm. working with organizations like HALT mm -hmm. to uh, identify and purchase these properties these properties. Mm -hmm. um, some, of the, some of these we bought through mm -hmm. town meetings, some of these we bought through private money like through HALT. Mm -hmm. so, um, and I'm, um, I'm familiar with HALT because I was Eagle Scout mentor mm -hmm. for, for um, mm -hmm. Boy Scout Troop 1 for many years and worked with mm -hmm. Dave Goldman and Jeff Ferber to identify um, those, those trails. Yeah, um, no. Such a great win-win. <laughs> yeah, such a great win-win yeah. because the scouts you know, really have this wonderful sense of responsibility and accomplishment mm -hmm. and leadership, and Hopkinton gets a great trail out of right. it. Right. Well, know. we did it with the trails club with Barry Acres too. Yeah. And you founded the trails club. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's Thank awesome. you for yeah. doing it. But it was it was a great yeah. The mm -hmm. open space is key, and I think it helps keep the character of the town. Exactly. And, you know. Um, I was served on the Land Use Study Committee and actually worked with the Open Space Committee and CPA, Community Preservation Act Committee, to get funding for the um, rail trail yep, right. um, over there. Right. But it was it was interesting how those boards all work together. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, despite all of us having our opinions, I think it's good to have a balance Absolutely. on the boards because mm -hmm. I think, yep. you know, as much as we want everybody to think the way we do, <laughs> I think having a balance on the boards really mm -hmm. has a best out, the best outcome. I, when I joined the board, we had two females, and I was the only Democrat, and oh. now we have uh, four females and mostly Democrats. And it's nine members, right? Yes. Nine member board. It changes over And I, I actually was it really flows. pleased um, when I reached out to to have somebody come over and speak to us. Um, I was really pleased that John Ferrari said, the chair now, he said, um, the new changes to the board that I've implemented makes us a board of equals. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, well, one thing I John said, he said, well, in order to become chair, I really need that? some help. And, and John, great. Fran, and myself are, are the senior members. Yeah. And I said, John, so do whatever you, you need to help. Or? Well, we, we each project chair uh, project. Oh. So I just, Project manage Whisper Ridge, which is next to 495 off of Wood Street. That's so smart. And it's next to some town conservation share the land. Workload so no one gets burnt mm -hmm. out. Too. And we worked with the developer to identify trails where the tra and trails and where the yep. where the town land is and mm -hmm. and what we could do to help what he could do to help the mm -hmm. town. He's putting in a sidewalk along Wood Street. Yep. He's offered Perfect. and uh, working with the trail Upper Charles Trail Committee, yeah. uh, putting in a horse trailer turnaround area. Oh. Yay, so, that's awesome. And, and the other thing about that is that each of you then mm -hmm. is a specialist right. for your own project, and you would right. become the so then expert. We, then we have the time of everyone to just, talk perfect. to developers, talk to what the committees. What a brilliant thing. Well, that saves time Thanks, on John. the committee. Well, but yeah, yeah, unfortunately, our segment is up. Oh, There's so yep. much to talk about. Sorry. Yeah. So that was really helpful. Yeah, thank um, you. So you have so there are nine members. You have five vacancies coming up. We have two 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 vacancies right now. Um, oh. John C. So he's thinking of rerunning. Hello, rerun. Yeah. And Irv Ann's running for board of selectmen. He filled a one-year oh. seat last year. Okay. And okay, um. And I have to say, Irfan, no, he was elected. Oh, he was elected. is oh. fabulous. Mm -hmm. He he's um, doing my real estate transaction because he's oh, a real estate lawyer. Very His reasonable. His office is right next door. Very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Very um, competent. So awesome. nice well, guy. John and Irv Ann are both lawyers, and I. Oh. I, Oh, you mean they're <laughs> they're not competing against each other? Oh no no no, they're, they're, but they, it's good having a legal mind on yes, the board because we absolutely. consider legal issues. Yes, and, right. um, it's fabulous. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your service yeah. to the community, and, and, we'll, be back, and we'll be back uh, with spring planting tips. Did you know there are other ways to reduce your pain besides taking medications? For example, mindfulness. I'm Dr. Mike Guidi, a family medicine doctor based in Essex County. I use mindfulness techniques with my own patients during office visits, and I'm here to tell you how you can prevent addiction. It is a way to train your brain to manage pain. Reducing your pain through mindfulness could mean you need less medication 
or a safer type of medication. It can also help you reduce your stress and recover from past trauma. That means you become less likely to develop an addiction, whether opioids, alcohol, or any other substance. In brain research, we scan people's brains before they start practicing mindfulness, and after they've been practicing it daily for eight weeks. We see actual changes in the way their brains are wired. We see those people drawing more on their judgment and reasoning skills, resulting in safer behaviors. Massachusetts has great resources about effective mindfulness techniques. To find out more, go to massmed.org. This week on Wake Up and Smell the Poetry, poets, storytellers, and musicians perform and share their original works. If you flip the back seat forward, you can handle your sleep twice so much to begin. And up till breeze is red. Now the squirrels in the leafless tree. Welcome back. So our third segment is going to be on spring gardening preparation. I know in my garden, I'm seeing the little iris peeking mm -hmm. up and the little... Um, Crocus. I think it may be tulips are... Oh, you're seeing tulips. Or right. daffodils. Maybe it's daffodils. daffodils so come, just yeah. little things starting to nose up a little through the, through the um, mulch yeah. for left over by leaves from the fall. So right. It feels like spring. It does feel like spring. I, the groundhog said six more weeks, but... Yeah, it is. And it's supposed to snow, but it still feels... Yeah, but it's still not a sticking snow. Yeah, and so the, so the ground looks to me like, you know, the way the, the plants are coming up. The permafrost is, yeah, exactly. going away. Or the, yeah. not permafrost, the yeah. ground frozen ground so I have uh, so you, you you have some things and I have some things. so what I, I if you want I can start with the plant times so what you want to do is in March we're zone six in Hopkinton by the way if you look it up in our planning zones you can kind of search out what are your yep. planning zones in your zip code area and we're zone and six Weston nurseries has all of that right information too. right they have out there a huge resource yes so in March what you want to do to start seeds indoors broccoli cauliflower spinach okay mid-march you want to do beets and kale lettuce peas and tomato Huh. So there's a lot of stuff you can start early yeah. indoors. And I do vegetables. that. vegetables. Yeah, I kind of save seeds and I buy seeds. And then this year I was part of a community farm, so I saved some stuff over from that. Mm -hmm. And I had stuff kind of growing over the winter. I keep my herbs in the winter. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things you want to plant at certain times of year. So you, what your ideal thing is to get the most out of the growing season. Mm -hmm. Most people don't think to plant until May. And the problem is we have such a short growing season uh -huh. that most of your plants are your vegetables. Rare, your vegetables right. won't mature. So, so. You, so what you're saying is you plant them inside, mm -hmm. and then do you have them in a sunny window? I do, but I don't have a lot of sun. Probably much okay. like your house. So you, I, well, you would have sun in the back of your house, but it's shaded. Yeah, and I don't, I don't have a lot of area in my yeah. house. I yeah. have like a window that I can put it in, but that's not high sun. My front window gets a little bit more sun and they happen to be bay windows with a shelf. But actually you can buy very inexpensively oh, right. the little mm -hmm. crates mm -hmm. that have a greenhouse cover. Mm -hmm. So that kind of accentuates the sun. And one thing I found with my garden this year, I had a very successful garden, which I struggle with because of the sun. I actually put in landscape cloth under it, oh, put good. all my const post on top and then I put landscape cloth on top oh, of it. Oh, so it's smart. And then I just cut holes, holes and, and put my plants job. in it. But I think the mm -hmm. landscape cloth on top helped keep the moisture in but also radiated the sun's heat. Oh, because it's absorbing like yes. polar bear skin. So I never, that was the first year I did that and my garden was better than oh, it ever has. Idea. And I've been there, what, 17 years. So good idea. Yeah, so what, tell me what well, you so got. I so have, there's prep. Um, this, yeah, so what I have seven things you could do to for great spring gardening preparing your soil done as early as possible so outdoors now mm -hmm. and this is probably flowers more than um vegetables i think but um so they said till the garden area at eight to twelve inches below the surface and get rid of rocks or debris mm -hmm. i know i've tried to plant where there's gravel underneath and yeah, it's really you unsuccessful just don't have for the nope. so the and you really need to, to, to fill that and mm -hmm. bring in some topsoil Next major step, after you have tilled the garden area 8 to 12 inches deep, 
Yeah. Then you add organic matter and fertilizer, so that would be manure or mulch. So or I should talk um, talk to your local farms. Like yeah. I have tons Horse. of compost, and I compost yeah. it well. I don't put anything bad in it. it it's I, and I've been composting for years, but a lot of farms will give you compost for free. Uh huh. Including there me. you go. So you, you know what I mean. Compost. So those are those are ways that you can get a really nice rich soil right for your because i mix chicken poop and horse well the poop, thing though and, you if know, you, but, have, but you have to be careful when you use that in soil that you're eating vegetables out of because there has been some e-coli on lettuce no because they're you, using you actually the way you process it and i'll talk about the process yeah, yeah, you yeah. lime it so oh, the okay. liming kills the e-coli oh, okay. and so what i do is so once a month is i lime my compost Mm -hmm. When I put stuff, we kind of scoop the manure out there, and then I have a tractor come twice okay. a year that flips it all over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have grass. So it's clippings. a process. Yeah, I mean, they're in. You know, everybody does it a different way, but um, I've had people that have picked up compost at my house for years. Perfect. And you should come over with it when you're ready. <laughs> no, I don't do. Yeah. I do container vegetables. Oh, right. Yeah. So then this is saying avoid tilling when your soil is too wet. Yeah. Because extra water hinders plant growth. Right. Second yeah. thing is weeding your yard. Mm -hmm. um, because the weeds choke, yep. you know, the, anything that's and trying to grow. Virulent, Start yeah. early mm -hmm. and do a little at a time so you don't get exhausted doing it all at once. Yep. Fertilize with coffee grounds. Yeah. Have you done that? I have. Um, during actually, the winter, cardboard boxes actually work really well for weeding. So, like, cool. if you save your old cardboard, you can... I've done that before, and that works really well yeah. as well. So this is saying during the winter, you might have moved shrubs to indoor planters. Bring them back out again in spring. Mm -hmm. Using coffee grounds to prep the soil is a great way to save money and will be a little more green. The, the grounds are filled with nitrogen, which didn't occur to me. Yeah. Never thought of that. Yeah. Um, a mineral that aids in vegetable and plant growth. Yeah. And then I guess if you're a coffee drinker, your garden smells delicious. Right, <laughs> right. And actually, it's a natural pesticide or, ah. or pest deterrent, I should say. So it keeps pests out of the... That makes sense. Yeah, so that's another benefit fun. of coffee grounds. Yep. Another thing you can do while I'm thinking about it is you can, when you get romaine lettuce, yes, you can actually cut the top off or use it all and then put it in a little saucer and it'll grow roots. You can plant that. I did that last year. You can do that with celery. You inside? Do, um, you start it inside, but then you move it to right, your garden. Right, right. So, so you let it's... it root out and then you ah. just move it to your garden. But you can do that with a lot of plants, mm -hmm. a lot of vegetables that you can re move to your garden. and then Cool. Actually, what I do is let my tomatoes, some of my tomatoes just drop on the ground and mm -hmm. they self-seed. Yes. So, you know, you cover them in the winter with whatever you got, but... That, so you it. so they'll stay they'll stay the seed won't die in the fr in the freeze no oh cool no so I found that works as I well I love knowing that so you're our expert how about that <laughs> so herbs um, come back then this says or, yeah. use cooking water on your plants mm -hmm. um, watering your plants using leftover cooking water is another great way to add a nutrient boost with the vegetables and vitamins and minerals left behind after you boil pasta yep. vegetables or potatoes yep. And obviously, let it cool down before you water right. the plants. Well, and also, it's a good use of your mm -hmm. your stuff. Yeah. I mean, you're reusing everything, exactly. and that's the way I like to look I at my too. farm. You know, like I I give any leftover stuff to my chickens, or compost it, or you know, just to reduce waste and and actually just kind of that's how farmers have done things for sure. thousands well, makes of sense. years. It you makes know, sense. and one two thing that's really important I find um, being there for 17 years, I try to rotate right where I put my yep. certain vegetables or flowers or whatever I rotate my crops right because each type of plant pulls out different types right. of nutrients out of the soil so that's another way to have and that's you know, just good more farm. yield yeah, yeah yeah that's smart um, and then this is chamomile tea ah. can ward off plant infections yeah. so this says watering your plants with chamomile tea again when it's cool, yep. is a great way to help ward off bacterial and fungal infections yep. that will come with springtime. Interesting, Spraying I your, didn't know that. Yeah, That's spraying great. your plants with chamomile tea mix a few times a week will help stop your seedling from damping off. And it sounds what, like it just gets that mildew. That sounds better when, what I use, I actually use like water with a little bit of vinegar and a drop oh, of dish yeah. soap, but I would that. rather do chamomile right. tea. So this is chamomile tea. Yeah. It doesn't say how strong to make it, yeah. um, but it just says spray the them a few it. times a week. Chamomile tea mix a few times a week. And that's so easy to do. Yeah. And I'd rather do that than my old preparation. Right. So. I'm sure you know this one, plant eggshells. Egg yep. yep. Egg um, calcium. In the same hole that you're planting the vegetables, helps them avoid blossom and rot, mm. which is caused by a calcium deficiency. 
Mm, yeah, just be sure to that. grind up the eggshells as yeah. much as possible. Yeah. Well, that's a cool fun fact. And this says... I have lots of eggshells. <laughs> garden at night. Oh, no bugs biting well, you. Well, I don't know. People believe that planting at night... This is experts. Architecturalgardendesign.com is their, their reference. Planting at night will help your garden grow faster and stronger than planting by day. Oh, maybe because it's less vulnerable to the sun? I don't know. And it holds water maybe, easier, oh, so the roots... Yeah, well, okay. so that's what it says. Planting at night... Um, also maximizes your water usage so mm -hmm. that you don't water and then it evaporates in the sun. Right. You're, it's, then it says just be sure you have proper lighting to see what you're doing, right. obviously. And uh, then they're That's just great. Yeah. So so but that actually makes total sense because like if you do it at night and then actually what happens when you put water on the leaves of the plant, the sun oh, can yeah. burn the leaves. Right. So and that actually makes a lot of sense. At night. So then, then there That's were good. some people that wrote in. Um, so the tips, the tips I found was um, Beekman1802.com. Just a guy who who has garden tips. Beekman1802.com. So then, then someone responded and said, use foam egg cartons. I'm sure you did this. So you're saving eight to, oh, to six to eight cartons of used eggshells and put them in the empty foam cartons. Fill eggshell halves with starter soil. Plant yeah. two to three I seeds in each. This eggshell half and water so you're planting actually in the eggshell that half. Made, that's so smart right and i, I have tons of eggshells. and water <laughs> ha about a teaspoon tablespoon of water to each eggshell every other day until so the plants easy. emerge that's right so easy so you and just, then you have don't have drainage you, it all stays in the egg crack shell. the egg put it back in the foam carton that's so smart Yay. amazing right um, See, you learn new things. I know. <laughs> when the plants are large enough to transplant outside, prepare the garden spot, move plant with eggshell from a carton, gently crush the shell, and plant as usual, but you put the eggshell down in there with the soil. Right, because you're getting that calcium that's again amazing. for the soil. That's yep. awesome. Yep. And then See, another that's one. that's all using the things in, your, awesome. in the farm. Yeah. That's, so just, just, you know, that was someone that responded. And you do a lot of flowers, actually, in I your do. garden. I mean, I've yeah. done flowers, but I do more kind of like perennials because I yeah. have a lot of lilies and I have, like, Lilac, which are not flowers of bushes, but no, they're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And well, and, they, and they're you tricky. Have that gorgeous. Well, that so bush. so hydrangea. I remember from working at Western Nurseries. If you put it, I think they need. I want to say alkaline soil. Yeah, uh, um, that changes the color. So you have right. So mm -hmm. it depends what you fertilizer you put down, whether it's, it's a vibrant color or yeah. So um, and then the other thing is, um, Western Nurseries has a lot of Hybrid. different things to put on on Hydrangeas. shrubs is one thing right. and a flowering plant plant is another thing yeah. and I don't have all those names in my head now but I know that there yeah. are specific fertilizers that will encourage blooming yes. growth there are specific fertilizers fertilizers that will encourage you know the plant to be a strong healthy plant yeah um, my rose of Sharon and I think a lot of people have this happen will just seed itself seed itself seed itself I mean just uh, unbelievable yeah um, prolific seeding yeah it's like and lily of the valley in my yard they oh, i love everywhere. those well they spread yeah. but this actually makes a beautiful bud which hummingbirds come to Ooh. it's a hibiscus variant Ooh. so the hummingbird will come but um so the what happens is the seed pod that's yeah. left over after the flower makes a lot of seeds and it drops the seeds and then right there we have all over the place wow yeah so i would suggest too a lot of the plantings i've gotten from my yard and i've shared with others like i have hostas and i have the lilies of the valleys i have the day lilies yeah you can if your friends have some, right. most of us that have a lot of that i mean the root bulbs for my hostas are that big every spring i want to split them because exactly. they're starting to look like bushes yeah. or so, lilies so in, yeah instead of buying them talk to your friends that have gardens mm -hmm. and most of us want to kind of keep that under control that's a good right. way to start a garden really inexpensively or no expense at all yeah and i know the garden club has a sale yeah i'm not sure when but i feel like it's spring yeah it is because um, yeah, that's the time when you mostly split those yeah those um yeah and i plants. actually gave them some rows of sharon oh i should i gotta give them more i actually Talk. planted hostas on the trail but i should give them a bunch of hosta too uh -huh. but even if you have that in your garden and you want to share it tell your friends Right, you know, because all or you put do it is up on the buy nothing Hoppington. Right, right, you know, that's or, a great, great resource. Yeah, and it's just a great way to make our town beautiful. You yeah, know? yeah. 
So um, with the vegetables, um, I thought it was interesting. I've never had luck with melons, which I oh. thought was interesting because I've always wanted to try it, and I always see melons when I travel and things like that. But um, I had been starting them too late. You oh. start them in March. So I I never had them grow, and I'm like, I like the perfect, I can do it actually on the compost pile. That's a perfect place for a melon. So you start them outdoors or indoors? Indoors. You start it indoors, and then you you plant it in May. You start it now, Mm -hmm. a melon seed, and then you you plant it in wherever you want. And you remember, they grow. Yeah, they (laughs) spread. They need need a little bit of sun, but just lots of area to grow. So. Mm I think I'm going to try that. I found that out. And same with like summer squashes and things like that. I, mm-hmm. I haven't had the greatest luck, but I never started them indoors first. So do you, um, do you till the soil now or you just do it, you do it after your plant has come up enough to... No, I till it in the spring. So what I'll do is I'll pull that landscape cloth off this year yeah. and I'll go and I'll just turn it all. And I have a really small area. It's probably 10 by 10. Uh-huh. Well, that's and I get a huge yield from yeah. it. I had more tomatoes than I knew what to do. I had cucumbers, I had peppers, I had tons of herbs. Like I had really a lot and I was even giving stuff away. So, you know, it was really, it takes me maybe a half hour to turn all that soil with a shovel and, and then I put the landscape cloth on the top and, it, you know, I add more compost and then kind of build, I keep building it up a little bit. But I do remove some of that dirt and turn yeah. it into the compost and then bring some of the compost back. Right. And then when, you're, when your season is grow, is how often do you rotate the, the plants? Every year. Every I year. Kinda, I kind of move them just a tiny batch. So like in the one corner uh-huh. I had tomatoes this year, I'll move it over. So I kind of do a circle. So it's the same 10 10 foot square yeah but I'm adding new soil all the time so I'm adding my compost every time but that's something that I kind of track I have a little map that Mm -hmm. I draw out and in the spring I'm like okay this is what I'm gonna yeah and how I'm gonna plant it and and get to know your your land and what works you know Mm -hmm. I guess that's the best thing to do yeah well that's interesting so um what would your advice be to someone who's I'm gonna consider you an expert now to someone who's starting out um planting and they want to start growing some seeds because i know some seeds are harder go easy to germinate. i mean actually i find herbs very easy you can keep them inside they don't get too big and you can use them a lot so and they grow quickly uh-huh. so herbs are very easy like, basil okay. is really easy cilantro does go to seed but now they have some hybrid cilantro okay that doesn't go to seed you can do mint careful with yes, mint. Yes, I have mint. Because it... Mint it, grows wild. It, it grows wild, and same with oregano. Mm-hmm. So, but, you well, know, I'd say start with herbs, and then you can always buy... All right, and thank you very yeah. much for all of that expertise. Yep. That's actually our show for today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. 